one of the things I want to talk to you about is dealing with the problem of pain and suffering. Many times, in fact, probably one of the more often questions that I get when someone is following Christ, why is there so much pain and suffering in the world? To put it another way, some people might ask, where is God when it hurts? Why would God allow something like that into our lives? Well, take a look at this opening. You hear these statements a lot. Every day something tragic happens. A child dies, cancer takes another life, an earthquake kills thousands. It forces people to ask the question, if God is loving and merciful, why is there pain and suffering in the world? Well, that's a good question. And thankfully, the Bible sheds a lot of light on this subject. Check this out. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. That's the declaration of the very first verse in the first book of the Bible, Genesis. The next couple of chapters explain in broad terms what God made over the course of the six literal days he used to complete his creation. Light, the sky, plants, animals, and humans. That's right, God created everything, and according to Genesis 131, he saw everything that he had made, and indeed it was very good. That is, it was complete and perfect. There was no death and no suffering. There was no survival of the fittest. Animals didn't attack and eat each other. Adam and Eve, the first two humans, did not kill animals for food. Genesis 129 through 30 makes it clear that man and animals ate only fruits and vegetables. So the original creation was wonderful, peaceful, without death, full of life and joy, and all enjoying the presence of God, the Creator. So what in the world happened? How do we get from there to here? Well, something drastic must have happened that altered the original creation, and that something was sin. Remember, God created a perfect world and placed Adam and Eve in paradise. As their creator, he had authority over them, and in his authority, God gave them a rule. In Genesis 2.17, God said, But of the tree of knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day that you eat of it you shall surely die. Well, Adam and Eve heard the rule loud and clear, but they willfully disobeyed it. They ate from the tree God told them not to. They chose to live by their rules and separate themselves from God. So the Creator kept his promise that punishment would follow their disobedience. With the rebellious act of one man, sin entered God's creation and death along with it. But the effects of sin didn't stop there, because God had given dominion over all of creation to man in a very real sense. The sin of man affected all of creation. In Genesis 3, we see the beginning of a cursed creation. Thorns and thistles were now part of the world, as well as pain and suffering and death. The world was no longer perfect. It was sin cursed. And that's why tragic things still happen today. And before we give Adam and Eve the full rap, we have to realize that all of us still willfully sin against God. That should make us really pause and think. But for now, at least on this topic, enough said. I would ask, Pastor, why is there so much pain and suffering? Couldn't God just deal with the problem? Couldn't he just fix mankind's biggest problem? To which I would ask the question, what is the biggest problem that we as people face? Is the biggest problem that we are faced with death? Pain and suffering. Is that the biggest problem? I would certainly say no. In fact, death is really just a symptom of the biggest problem. Pain and suffering is really symptomatic to what the real problem is. And what is the real problem? Sin is the real problem. Sin is where everything that was good became less than good. Sin is really the problem that confronts all of us. And so God chose to deal with the problem. He sent Jesus Christ to deal with the problem and not just the symptom of the problem. So when Jesus came to this earth, he paid the price for our sin, dealing with our problem. So as much as he has dealt with the problem, there still will be some symptoms of that problem as long as we live on this earth. There will be pain. There will be suffering. Now ultimately, we might ask in a different way, well, why do bad things happen to good people? I mean, if we are following after God, wouldn't we just expect that everything would go well? Well, if you have that expectation, you're going to be disappointed. Because we are following Christ does not mean everything will always go well. 
It does mean everything will end well. But how we get to that ending may be different than what we would normally expect. Well, here's the point. What I want us to do is understand that we can trust God even in difficult times. We can trust God, especially in difficult times. What I want to focus on is first I want to answer that question, where is God when it hurts? And he is in the same place he always is, not far from any one of us. When God allows difficulty to happen, we have a choice to either come to God with trust by faith or we have the opportunity to turn against God. What I want you to see this morning is why we should trust God even in, especially in the difficult times. If you have a copy of God's word, we're going to be in the book of Romans. The book of Romans is right after the four gospels in the book of Acts. Uh, And this chapter that we're going to be looking at, Romans chapter 8, really helps us understand how we can put our faith in God, especially in trying times. So I hope that you'll be able to see why we should trust God, especially in the difficult times. We're going to be looking at Romans chapter 8, and as you are able, would you stand with me as a demonstration of respect for God's holy written Inerrant word. Romans 8, and I'll start just in verse 28. And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good. For those who are called according to his purpose. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. In order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those he predestined, he also called. And those he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also along with him graciously give us all things? Would you pray with me? Father, as we come to a fairly familiar passage to many of us, we want to understand why we should trust you, especially when times are tough. Father, we thank you that we can know that you are a good God, and then you have good in store for us. So help us, Father, no matter what we may face today, to always trust you. This we pray. In Christ's name, and God's people said. Thank you. you. May be seated. So this is the main idea I want you to take home. I can trust God when times are tough. If you get this, you paid for your gas this morning. I can trust God when times are tough. Now, there's only three types of Christians. Uh, There are those Christians who have just come out of a great season of suffering. There are those Christians that have had a very difficult time recently in the past. Some of you might be those Christians. Then there are those Christians who are right now in a difficult time of suffering. Right now, things are not like they should be, not like you want them to be. So there are those Christians who have just gone through suffering. There are those Christians who are currently in suffering. And then the last type of Christians are those who will soon suffer. Jesus gave us an indication that as long as we are on this world, there will be difficulty. And so this message is important for all of us. Even if right now everything is right for you, we still want to learn why we should trust God, especially in the tough times. And we're going to see really two reasons why we can trust God, even in the difficult times. Uh, The first thing it will say, we'll look at Romans 8, 28. And again, this is a very common passage, perhaps. It says, and we know... 
For those who love God, all things work together for good. For those who are called according to his purpose. Now that passage gives us by implication our first real point. If the Bible says always those who are called according to his purpose, that is believers, uh, those who love God, again another term for believers, uh, for every believer always everything will always turn to good. For that to be the case, that means that there is a powerful force somewhere behind believers that is always taking that which is bad and moving it towards good. Doesn't mean everything in our life will always be good, but everything in our life will bring good. This is what I wrote down, point number one. God has demonstrated compassionate sovereignty. Why should you trust God? He has demonstrated compassionate sovereignty, compassion, love. He's demonstrated that he loves us. And he's also demonstrated sovereignty. Sovereignty is his rule. He is king. So we have a God that is in control of everything and a God that loves us. Now this is a problem for some people because they can't get there. They would say either... God doesn't really care, so he lets whatever happens happen. Or, God is not strong enough to stop certain things. Because if God is sovereign in control of everything, and he is also loving, why do we have pain and suffering? And this is a question a lot of people struggle with. Why does God allow Difficult things to come. What we understand is, that's what he's always told us. He never told us that this life would be easy. In fact, in John chapter 16, this is what Jesus said. He said, I have said these things to you, that in me you may have peace. In the world... You will have tribulation, but take heart. I have overcome the world. John 16, 33. I wrote it down this way under point number one. Uh, God will allow some difficulty. If we have the expectation that as soon as we surrender to Christ, everything is going to be okay, we're going to be disappointed. Ultimately, Jesus said, as long as we are on this earth, we're going to have some trouble. Now, ultimately, we understand that when we take Jesus for his word, that we will have trouble. It shouldn't surprise us. But what the Bible does say, it doesn't matter if we experience difficulty, because ultimately, God will bring good out of that difficulty. And in fact, we know that there are some real reasons why God allows us to suffer. And you can just write this down in your notes somewhere. I give you three reasons why God allows us to, stu- to suffer. Uh, the first reason is suffering purifies. Just somewhere in your notes. Suffering purifies a believer. Remember the Bible talking about a refiner's fire? That the fire of affliction can cause us to be purified. It's a little bit like this. I remember we were at the dinner table, and uh, my wife was finishing up with some dinner and sitting there with the kids, and the kids were just kind of, you know, being kids. And I remember my wife said, okay, kids, it's time to get serious. To which uh, Drew, evidently by some puzzling look on his face, uh, was told by his older sister said, Drew, do you know what it means to get serious? He said, no. He said, that means somebody's about ready to get spanked. (laughs) And it's probably true. And whenever mommy says that, it's it's getting to be that time. But if you are a parent that loves your child, you will introduce suffering to them. You will apply the board of correction to the seed of learning if you love your child. 
Right? And so in that, we know that God sometimes allows suffering into our life. Yea, he even brings suffering into our life to make us better. Uh, we can look at that as discipline sometimes. And not only does suffering purify, suffering proves. Suffering proves our faith. That when we encounter difficulty, it allows us to know how strong our faith really is. That is not for God. God does not need to know how strong our faith is. We need to know how strong our faith is. And God will allow us to experience difficulty so at times we can really see how strong our faith is. The Bible talks about that in 1 Peter chapter 1. You can look that up a little bit later. But in 1 Peter 1, it talks about that these difficulties... If need be, you have suffered trials of all kinds and all types. They have come so that your faith of greater worth than gold, although it is tested by fire, may be found to be genuine. And that's what sometimes will happen. God will allow suffering because it works as a test. Uh, suffering proves. Last thing, suffering produces. Suffering purifies. Suffering proves. And suffering produces. What does suffering produce? Ultimately, suffering helps us to better produce our dependence upon God. There are very few things like suffering that drives us back to God. If everything was going well, most of us would probably not spend much time at the feet of Jesus. But it is when things get difficult that we're reminded of how much we need God. In fact, I thank God for the times in my life where I am absolutely, totally unable to make any difference in the problem in my life. Because I, I stop and at that point in my life, I am uniquely aware that I can't do anything without God. When I am experiencing difficulty that is beyond my ability to handle it, then I am understanding what I should always understand. I can't do it without God. So those are things that are good reasons why God allows suffering. With that being said, it doesn't make it easy. Suffering still hurts. So we can understand that there will be good that will come from that. Look again in the text, Romans 8, 28. And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good. Does that mean the problem that you recently faced, God will use it for good? Does that mean that the problem you're currently in, the problem that causes you to want to curse God, the, the problem that causes you maybe to, to want to question God, that problem right now will be used for good? Yes, that's what we know. And because we know that, we are able to trust God. I wrote it down this way under point number one. Letter B, everything will work together for good. I can trust God when times are tough because he's demonstrated compassionate sovereignty. He's in control. And because of that, I know whatever is in my life, though it may not be good, will be used for good. And I don't know which of those reasons it may be, but that's not really the point. The point is, regardless of why you are experiencing difficulty, you can still trust God because he's going to turn it into good. Now, I'll be honest, this verse a lot of times is thrown at people and can seem a bit trite. It's up there with God works in mysterious ways. You know, you're going through a difficult time and somebody comes up to you, maybe meaning well, and they say, well, you know, God works in mysterious ways. And it's not that that's not true. 
It's better than what I sometimes hear. Well, you know, God will not put on you more than you can bear. That's not even true. The Bible never says that. In fact, the Bible says he will put on us more than what we can handle so that we are turning back to him. But beyond that, sometimes it sounds a bit trite, and it might look a little bit like this. Oh, hi. Here we have one small child and one ice cream cone. Do you like ice cream? Yes. I'll bet you do. Mmm. Delicious. Oh, be not ye disappointed. For as it is written, the good Lord will provide free unlimited ice cream in heaven to all those who believe. No, it doesn't. I'm sure it says it somewhere in the Bible. I'm sure it doesn't. The, in the dairy chapter. No. In the list of ingredients. It's in the back. You gotta flip through once you get past the credits. No, it doesn't. It's, well, I've clearly read more of the Bible than you have. Well, look, it's dripping all over my hand. See, had you been holding this, this would have dripped all over your nice purple dress, and you would have been upset, so I'm saving you from tears of sadness. Eh. It's really good. Give me a break. <clears throat> I'm gonna give you a timeout. And sometimes you may have been like that child. You're, you're wondering what's going on and somebody just walks up and unpacks something like, uh, you know all things work together for good. And that may not come as a relief at first. I mean, that's very much the truth. But at times we maybe don't wanna hear that we maybe just want to have someone listen to us. And maybe at times you've been like the gentleman that instead of looking at what the problem is, you just wanted to easily throw a verse at someone. But here's the point. Although it may seem a bit trite in trying times to say everything works out for good, but it's still true. And that's not the only reason why we trust God. We can trust God because he is sovereign and he is compassionate and it will work for good. But there's another reason. Look again in the text. And it says, for those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. And or that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. Those he predestined, he also called. Those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. There's a lot of theology in those verses that I'm not going to be able to unpack. But what's interesting to me is not just in that verse, but this entire chapter. If you look again at the last part of that verse 30, it says, those he called, he justified. Those whom he justified, he also glorified. What's interesting about that to you? Now, the Bible does say those people who are saved have been called by God. No real surprise there. Those people who have been called by God have also been justified by their faith. No big surprise there. But then it says those whom he justified, he also glorified. Speaking of past tense, those people who have been bought with a price, have been forgiven of all sin, have also been glorified. And you might say, well, we're not glorified yet. Was Paul using the wrong tense? I mean, he could have said, and those who are justified will soon be glorified. But he didn't say that. The reason why he didn't say that is because our glorification is as much a fact as if it had already happened. This is what I wrote down for point number two. God has delivered complete security. Why do I trust God in trying times? Well, his compassionate sovereignty. I know he's in control and he loves me. But then I also know that he's given complete security. And this is some debate among Christians about 
eternal security. Uh, But this chapter, Romans 8, it's hard to make it out of this chapter without seeing that those who are in Christ are completely secure. I mean, you look at Romans 8, 1, it says, There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. There's none. There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ. It doesn't say maybe. It says none. But then you look as the verses continue. You look at verse 31. It says that God is for us. What then shall we say to these things? Uh, If God is for us. It says verse 32 that Christ died for us. God has justified us in verse 33. And that God loves us in verse 34. Look again. Verse 34 says, who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who indeed is interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? And he goes and lists them. Verse 37, no, in all these things we are more than conquerors to him who loved us. And then he goes on to say, nothing will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. What will be able to separate us from God's love? All right, say it like you believe it. What will be able to separate us from God's love? Nothing. Nothing. That is a great assurance that we have eternal security. Now, people have a hard time with this. They'll say, if we believe that there's nothing we can do To get out of our relationship with God, wouldn't that mean that we just live however we want? Our security does not encourage us to live however we want. Our security encourages us to live how God wants. Our security has not freed us to sin, but our security has freed us from sin. And because we are secure that we know that we can Trust God. Look at it this way. The Bible never says that we are secure because of our grip upon God. If my relationship with God was based solely on how long I could hold on to him, that's not real strong. Our security is based upon God's grip on us, which is Very, very strong. So ultimately, we understand that we do have security. Ephesians 1 says it this way, and I like this. Ephesians 1 says, verse 13 and 14, In him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him, were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, who is a guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire the possession of it. To the praise of his glory. The Holy Spirit of God sealed us as a guarantee of your inheritance to come. And what's the only way in which God would give us a guarantee? Is if in fact it was like he said. It's not that we come to God and we think maybe so. We come to God and it says, definitely so. Now there's a difference between security and assurance. Security is an objective reality. You don't really need to believe it for it to be there. The fact that I am secure in my relationship with God because of by grace, through faith, I am saved. Because of that, I am secure. That's different than assurance. Assurance is the subjective understanding of my security. Assurance is me realizing and accepting I am secure. I mean, we understand and we know that we're not saved by works and that it's by grace. And because of it's by grace, it doesn't matter what we do. There's nothing we can do to earn God's salvation. It's not based on us. It's based on him. And there's nothing we can do in converse that we can lose our salvation. And that truth may be somewhat uncomfortable. The difference is we know we're secure, which means we are sure. 
And God ultimately wants our security to move to assurance. Look again in the text. How does it start off in verse 28? And we know. He doesn't say, and we think things may turn out well. It says, and we know. Talking about assurance. That because of our security, ultimately we will develop assurance that we will know. Now, some of you would say, yes, the security is not based upon me. That's what God has provided. That's what God has promised. That's what God has guaranteed. But the assurance is on you. Could God have made us in such a way that we would never doubt him? Could God have presented us with something that would just be beyond any reasonable doubt? Could have, but he didn't. I wrote this down under point number two, letter A. And God will allow some doubt. My security, that's what he has done. That's objective. My assurance, that's what I do. And although it should be that we could say, We know Uh, there's going to be allowed for us to have a little bit of wavering, what we call might be doubt. Now, I don't often hear that doubt being a good thing, but doubt can be a good thing. For instance, if you're being tried for murder, uh, if doubt were there, that would be a good thing, right? Right? Because you have to be convicted beyond a reasonable doubt. I remember it was a, a defense attorney was witnessing or was um, defending uh, this person that had been charged with murder. And the circumstances were not good. In fact, his client looked very, very guilty. The only thing that he had going for him is that they had never found the body of the person he was accused of. But still, there was overwhelming evidence and Uh, This defense attorney got to the point where he said, you know, I'm going to lose this case. So in a last-ditch effort, his closing argument went like this. Uh, Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, I've got a surprise for you. By the time one minute has passed from now, the person whom my client has been accused of murdering will walk into this courtroom. There was a hush. He slowly paused for emphasis as the minute ticked on. All of the juries, all the juries looking back at the door. A minute goes by, and you know what happens? Nothing. He looks at him and said, Okay, I lied about that. But all of you looked at the door. And because you looked at the door, that means you have some doubt. And because of that doubt, you cannot convict my client. Jury went in, deliberated for about half an hour, came back out, produced a a sentence of guilty. His defense attorney was like, wait a sec. I mean, he, he went up after the trial was over and he went up to the foreman of the jury and said, guys, I just don't understand. You all looked at the door. You all had some doubts. Said, yeah, we all looked at the door. But your client never did. Now you might think some doubt may be good in that instance. But think of it like this. An untested faith is really a faith that cannot be fully trusted. An untested faith cannot be fully trusted. And it's not because that we could say, okay, I know things are good because I just have an overabundance of faith. But we know things are going to be good because we can muster confidence in God. And it's okay if you have a little doubt. I mean, God would ultimately want us to move to a point where we do not have doubt, but that's okay if you do have some doubt. Here's the last thing I want to write down under point number two. 
Nothing can keep me from glory. Nothing can keep me from glory. The idea is simply this. It is as if you're already glorified. Verse 30. Those he called, he also justified. Those he justified, he also glorified. The reality of our glorification is ours. What does that do for us? We ultimately know what the future is. It doesn't matter what may enter our life. It doesn't matter what may cause us to have burdens. We know the future. We have glory that we're headed to. And because of that, that gives us the opportunity to have confidence in God. You know, ultimately, that we already have talked about that we know everything's going to work together for good. And I'm sure you've been in situations where something in your life you thought was bad. Yucky. Bad. But then it brought around good. And in hindsight, you're thinking, okay, that, that brought some good things. But this passage is telling us first we can use foresight, trusting God, because we know there's good coming. But beyond that, we also know that our future is secure. And because of our future being secure, we know that anything in our life, no matter how bad it may be, is always temporary. And glory is for eternity. So you see how those two things allow for us to, to really trust God. Uh, the first thing, again, by review, I can trust God because God has demonstrated compassionate sovereignty. And God has delivered complete security. With this, we can trust God. Take a look at this last video. It's possible to live our days knowing the promises of God and never receiving all he has for us. To us, the world is foreign Yet it's all we've ever known. Our boundaries are limitless, but we find serenity in a predictable refuge, a place where we control. We've settled for nearsightedness, left blind toward the outside. But there is a stirring within us, a stirring to know more, to experience more, to possess the promise for things yet to come. Fear of the unknown lingers, though nothing else satisfies. The moment lies before us to make the choice. Complacency or pursuit. Behold, it's a new day. The breath of the Almighty fills our lungs and gives us life. Death's shadow is eliminated and our God guides us with His life. We're infused with passion. His promises are within our sight. Though our steps are uncertain, He fails not. Cowards scurry, but we are not weak. We follow our hearts, our convictions, our calling through concealed paths. Doubt lurks, pain intrudes, yet we set our eyes on the prize before us. We may be delayed, but we will not be denied. We will rise. Greater is he who is in us. Creation is no match for the creator. Though the earth moves, we will not be shaken. We advance with a spirit of power. We cling to the truth. We hold fast to his promises. There is no compromise. We give our all to be in His presence, beyond expectation, beyond reproach. Sin, doubt, and familiarity have lost their grip. We endure the sweat of our brow for an unfathomable reward. Those whose hope is in the Lord will not be put to shame. We refuse to waver. We become stronger. We lay it all on the line for this. 
His promises are yes and amen. To God be the glory. You can trust God even in trying times. He's given us some incredible promises. First thing, God has demonstrated compassionate sovereignty. He has been good in the past. He is good today. And he will be good in the future. We can trust God because we know he loves us. And we know he's in control. So we know things are going to turn for good. Not only that, we also have complete security in God. Uh, Regardless of whatever else we may have in our life, we can rest sure that our relationship is secure. Last thing, I got two concluding points. As we move from why we can trust God, I want to close up with how. Where do you go from here? How do I go to trust God? First thing, look again in the text, and it says, Specifically, just back up a few verses. Look at verse 26. Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. For we do not know what to pray for as we ought, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. First thing I wrote down, first concluding point, I can begin with an honest conversation with God. How do you get to a point where you're fully trusting God? If you're not there right now, you can come before God and just have an honest conversation. Say, God, I'm hurting right now. I don't like what's going on. It's hard for me to trust you when things keep going the wrong way. It's hard for us to realize good is coming because right now all we see is bad. God already knows that. God already knows that you feel that way. But how much different is it when we're honest with God? Uh, The Bible says in Philippians 4, Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your heart's And your minds in Christ Jesus. Not only are we just trusting that we can come to God. But the Bible says the spirit of God that is in us. He prays. He encourages us towards prayer that we can't even fully understand. So it starts with an honest conversation with God. But then ultimately, I wrote this down last thing. I should build a healthy confidence in God. I should build a healthy confidence in God. A rock-solid faith does not come by accident. As you are progressing in your relationship with God, as you're reading Scripture, as you're coming to corporate worship, as you're involved in a life group ministry, those are things that help you build your faith. I just hope you're committed to do those things as we grow together. Let's pray. Father, I know that just by default, there are no doubt some people here going through an incredible tough time. Father, as much as it may be easy to question you and to even wonder about your goodness, Father, help us to trust you. Uh, Father, we know why we should trust you. You are good and you are in control. Father, we are secure in you. So help us to to come before you and have an honest conversation of where we are, but that we would would build our confidence, a healthy confidence in you. Through this, Father, that you would work now in this service as we choose to make decisions to trust you because we ask it in Christ's name. And God's people said, amen.